Good morning to each one, one and all. Uh, and we welcome you to the third Sunday in the Easter calendar, uh, whereby the church focuses on the rollout of Christ's life and now it's his resurrection. resurrection. And uh, uh, so, any announcements?
there's just a couple pages more if you haven't closed your book to number 204, O Word of God Incarnate, number 204. Now we'll open up with a word of prayer. Life is kind of funny. It is short, uh, painfully short sometimes, surprisingly short sometimes. And yet here we are again in the rhythm of worship and these rituals of gathering in your name, Lord, can become so familiar that we just simply flow through it, like driving from point A to point B. And we forget that we even passed through stoplights. It's so, so familiar. But Lord, this is not driving from point A to point B. This is a gathering of your people to worship you. And we have your promised presence, Lord, in each of our hearts as we are the new temple that you have created in your Son. And so, Lord, we call upon your name which is pleasing to you, as we did in the day of our salvation, so we do each and every Lord's Day. We call upon you, Lord, to bless us with your promised presence. And we look forward to your arrival. In Christ's name, amen. And now, for confession of sin, let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us therefore confess our sins as we worship our risen Lord. Heavenly Father, your Son's work of redemption is finished. While our flesh We 
desire, yet we push back. We hope, yet there is grief and sadness. We possess, yet not fully. It is this waiting, this not yet, that in part causes our hearts to be heavy. In ways that we cannot fully understand, we sin because we are yet sinners. Forgive us, O Lord, and renew us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have confessed together we are not what we should be. We are sinners. His law justly weighs in, making our conscience feel its transgression. Nevertheless, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ reign supreme. For the joy of gathering his people and in our place, Christ has both fulfilled the law and has borne the fury of a just and holy wrath. Our guilt is gone. He has also bound the strong man, freeing us from his bondage. Therefore, with joyous shouts of hallelujah, I declare to you God's work through Christ alone, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cry to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, I was dismayed. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. Now I direct you to the screen for Psalm 30.
And now we'll have the reading of God's holy word. Our first reading this morning is Acts 9, 1 through 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for the letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading... <clears throat> this morning is from Revelations, chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a, lo a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The word of the Lord.
The New Test, uh, the Gospel reading comes to us from John's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Hear the word of the Lord. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it, that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. And the other disciple came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went abroad and hauled aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. The word of the Lord. And stand as you're able. Let's sing hymn number 198, Jesus Shall Reign. shall reign where'er the sun does its successive journeys run his kingdom spreads from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more to him shall Oh. Uh -huh. 
book of Revelation, and maybe that's a, uh, some sort of a uh, Freudian slip in a non-sexual manner, meaning that uh, it's a daunting book, and uh, so I thought I would leave the Bible at home. Not consciously, but unconsciously, if Calvin can't write a commentary on it, uh, and the entire church history left it out of the uh, liturgy. Who am I to even preach on the book of Revelation? But alas, we have Bibles here, and uh, we will Ah, it's right here. OK. My beloved wife is passing out a little piece of paper for you to look at. And if you all, everyone has one? Okay. So, most of you are familiar with the some of the positions the church has taken on the book of Revelation. Our tradition has largely an all-millennial viewpoint. Awe is negation. Millennial meaning not that there's no millennium. That's why I don't like the name. I like realized millennium to describe our position. But nonetheless, it's no earthly, literal, thousand-year millennium. That's what all-millennialism all millennialism means. Uh, then there's post millennialism, and that's part of our tradition as, uh, as well. And that is that everything uh, in terms of the reign of Christ and every square inch of this earth comes under the lordship of Christ in a gradual way, sometimes with deep crevices of uh, chaos and so on. But eventually, history takes us to where every square inch is redeemed by God's people through his spirit. And that's post-millennialism. And then there's premillennialism. And all three of these have in our tradition, uh, in the EPC, an allowable uh, position. So this is not a, an essential. Uh, the EPC refuses to say, we're going to die on this hill. Uh, it's just not that kind of an issue. I'm reluctant to say that because then many just tune out and say, you know, it's just too difficult and I can't wait till you get back to something that I can relate to. But please don't do that. Uh, Premillennialism would take the millennial uh, reign of Christ literal and limit it to a thousand years on earth after Christ returns. And for some, the church gets raptured up when Jesus returns, and so the millennial reign of Christ, the church is absent in heaven, 
and the Jewish people finally get their king, they finally get their land, and then Christ rules and reigns throughout the whole world. And there's uh, so on and so forth. So many are familiar with those uh, four positions that I've mentioned. But there's another overlapping issue that uh, even my awareness, I'm just starting to uh, get a grasp on this, which is how do we approach Revelation? How should we even, as daunting as it is, how should we see it? And war produces strange bedfellows. And so we have f very conservative fundamentalists on the one end of the continuum of saying, uh, this is really a jigsaw puzzle, and all of these horns and all of these beasts and the mark they have specific reference, and we need to find out what they are. And so they put together this jigsaw puzzle. War produces strange bedfellows. Likewise, those on the left liberal end of the continuum believe that Revelation should be taken literally, and it's a jigsaw puzzle, and we need to put it together on all the detail. The liberal says, but, because we don't believe much in Revelation at all, the jigsaw puzzle is all in the past. So we're going to take this document that John wrote, and all of these reference have Nero, have Rome, have all of these past events and people, and we have to put this puzzle together. So there you have the extreme liberal end of the continuum and the conservative end of the continuum coming to the book in a similar way. It's a jigsaw puzzle and we need to get these details down and put it together to understand it. Now somewhere in the middle, for instance, the first commentary on the book of Revelation that the church has uh, is printed uh, on this sheet here. And his name was Victorinus. It's the first commentary on the book of Revelation that we have. That's not to say it's the first one that was written. One could have been written earlier that we don't have. And he gave us what some have now called the recapitulation theory. You know, when something recapitulates, it comes back again. Much like, uh, in a very loose sense, uh, reincarnation. You, you just come back, right? And you come back and you do it again. So this approach to the book of Revelation is not a jigsaw puzzle, but we're just going to take John at face value and look at the book and try to see what John is doing with things. And so rather than looking at the seals and the, uh, the uh, trumpets and all of these things and find a specific referent and put together a jigsaw puzzle to find out who and where and when all of this is going to happen or who, where, and when it did happen, this first commentary says the purpose of the book is to give hope to a suffering church and we're going to look at these struggles and these attacks and this warfare again and again from different angles. Sometimes these, and that's why I have these circles here, sometimes these circles intensify so not only do they revisit this theme of persecution, hope, faith, and warfare, but they intensify. And so it's really looking at the church, the present church that John was writing to, and all the churches thereafter until Christ comes back to encourage God's faithful bride to stick the, and stay the course and be faithful to your Lord Jesus Christ. And it does this by looking at persecution and God's promised wrath and God's promised salvation. And it looks at it with 
from different, slightly different perspectives and metaphors, and it builds in intensity until Revelation tells us, come Lord Jesus, come. Come quickly. And so that's kind of where I am at. So, and, and that the way to come to the book of Revelation is not necessarily tied to a particular position, though there's some that probably generally tie uh, these together versus something else and so on. Okay, now recapitulation has had a life of its own, and this is not an attempt to give you a detailed look. This is just to show you two things that have happened regarding looking at the book of Revelation in this uh, uh, revisiting manner. The first one is where we have the first commentary, and it notes things that are quite pulsating in the text if you're familiar with it uh, from start to finish. There's first of all in chapters 1 through 3 the seven churches, the seven messages for them. In Revelation chapter 4 through 7, chapters 4 through 7 are the seals. Uh, they're not the arf, 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 they're the uh, seals of a document. And then 8 through 11 are the trumpets. 12 through 15 are visions, 15 through 19 are the plagues, and 19 through 22 is the triumph. And that makes a lot of sense, and that stuck with the church for uh, over, uh, uh, over a thousand years. To see this different, uh, similar message from different angles, seals, trumpets, visions, plagues, all leading to the triumph of Jesus Christ. Now, the second one is a tweaking that happened, uh, I believe, in the 20th century, and his name, uh, I also left something else at, back home, and so I, I don't have it. I'll have it for you next week. But he looked at things in a similar way, in terms of revisiting these themes, just like the one above that we went through, but he changed them, and he made the book of Revelation Christocentric. And what do I mean by that? That it's a message about Christ. Now, that's not that the first one doesn't talk about Christ, but again, it's a matter of focal point. Are we going to look at the book of Revelation, and are we going to put on the glasses of Jesus Christ, as the major thing we're going to extract, the person of Jesus Christ, or are we going to look at the particulars uh, in which the book describes things, seals, trumpets, visions, plagues, and the final triumph? And I like the bottom one. Now, I'm not here to tell you this is the correct position, you need to believe it, and all this kind of stuff. I'm just trying to break the ice so that the book of Revelation is not a foreign object to you. So there's four things in the book of Revelation if we look at it Christocentrically. There's the letter scroll, Revelation chapters 1 through 3. There's the worship scroll, chapters 4 through chapter 11. There's the warrior scroll, Revelation 12 through Revelation 20. And the last tweaking on this position that I read reserved what, for lack of better phrase, the bridegroom scroll in the marriage supper of the Lamb in chapters 21 and 22. So this whole piece of paper is the way to look at the theory of recapitulation in terms of how to approach the book of Revelation, regardless of where you're coming from, there is some unanimity regarding the book of Revelation. It's a message to a persecuted people of God so that they might walk in perseverance because the Lamb finally gets ultimate victory and he's working it through, in and through history. That's the encouragement. Stay with it, folks. Stay 
fixed on your Lord, Jesus the Christ, your elder brother, because he will take you to the end. Now, whether your life ends before the end of this age, he'll take you to that end as well. Stay focused on Jesus. Stay focused on him in terms of faithful, covenantal obedience. Now, one of the arguments for this way of looking at the book of Revelation is that there are some bookends. Jesus Christ is mentioned in the very beginning of Revelation, and he's mentioned also at the very end. And so to me, those bookends move me to find Christ all the way through these cyclical and repeating themes in the book of Revelation. And I like how it's laid out here. We're in chapter 5 of Revelation today, but it's chapters 4 through 11 is the worship scroll. 12 through 20, warrior scroll. And 21 and 22, bridegroom scroll. You see how Christocentric that is. Do you see how you see the book of Revelation in and through Christ, his person and his work? So we're going to take a look now at the worship scroll segment of Revelation. And I will make one more notation here. I do want to read something so that you don't think it has come from me. Uh, after all, who am I? Uh, no one uh, of any repute in this academic world of ours. Um, but, uh, uh, did I mark it or did I just read it? Ah, yes, yes. It's a paragraph, so stay with me here. It's about the revised common lectionary. Now, I said last week, and I think I even repeated already here, that for when the lectionary was approved in the 15th century, there were 400 years of lectionary readings that contained no verses from the book of Revelation, except for a peculiar holiday outside of Sunday or something to this effect. Absent, gone. Uh, so this scholar is going to talk about the revised common lectionary, which has five or six Revelation uh, segments in the reading, and we are on them. And we're going to look at all five or six, however many there are, I didn't count them. Uh, we're going to look at them. So that's the revised common lectionary. That was updated in the 20th century. And it went from a one-year lectionary reading, and then repeating it every year, to a three-year lectionary reading. So we have the revised three-year common lectionary in which we go through calendar year A, B, and C, and then repeat A, B, and C. And he's talking about that lectionary. All right, so now listen to this. One measure of mainline churches use Revelation is the Revised Common Lectionary, which lists the scripture passages that are read in many Protestant and Roman Catholic congregations each week. Although Revelation is 22 chapters long, the lectionary selects only six short passages to be read. These include the opening and concluding greetings from God and Christ as the Alpha and Omega, together with the four scenes of the saints in glory. These texts are read during the Sundays after Easter once every three years. That's where we are right now. Hello, okay, just as a reminder. Easter, once every three years. And occasionally, one of these texts is also read on All Saints Day or Christ the King Sunday in November. The lectionary conveniently avoids passages mentioning the beast and the harlot, and passes by seven seals and other plagues without inviting comment. Some rather stern warnings do interrupt the read greetings at the end of Revelation, but these are omitted from the assigned readings so that the worshipers do not hear them. The result is a rather pleasant selection. 
Now, I've mentioned before, I find it curious when we read certain texts uh, that they leave out verses before or leave out after, and I always wanted to be a fly on the wall and find out why they did that. And I found a pattern. They often leave out verses of wrath and judgment. And so here I have vindication from a a scholar, Craig Coster, who has written a wonderful commentary on Revelation. He's a Lutheran scholar, and he too has noticed that our revised common lectionary gives us, oh, the sweetness and the positivity of Revelation. And it leaves out all the other stuff, all right? Uh, So... uh, Thus the love-hate of the lectionary, it would be nice that at some point we uh, have it rewritten to not purposefully leave out those things. And I'll make one more comment. After now having just said that, the lectionary has so much of wrath and judgment in it, I am simply sometimes overwhelmed with it all. And with the contemporary church that doesn't follow the lectionary, I think they pattern themselves after leaving out judgment and wrath, and most modern evangelical Bible-believing churches don't preach on hell. Don't preach on judgment. Don't preach on the wrath of God and the righteousness of God. They leave it out. Thus, I think the blessing of having a lectionary that forces the uh, preacher to deal with some of these texts uh, of judgment and wrath, because without it, you do not have a good picture of what historic Christianity is. Okay, now, we are in the worship scroll, and let's take a look at that. Chapter 5. This is a specific event going on here. And it's the throne in heaven, as this little title has it above the text of verse 1. No, that's chapter 4. Sorry. Chapter 5, the scroll and the lamb. So John now has already brought us into the throne room. He has seen how God is holy in chapter 4, verse 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Okay, so we're brought into the throne room with this holy God who is intimidating, if you will, uh, but he doesn't leave us there. Uh, In verse 11 of chapter 4, Worthy are you, our Lord, our God, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We're going to read right before the Lord's Supper that text that's created after these verses in chapter 4. So it's a marvelous uh, uh, affirmation of what we're preaching on right before the Lord's Supper. You'll see the text coming right out of these chapters in Revelation. Now we're in the throne room still, and John sees in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. Okay, so now the throne room drama continues, and the worship scroll continues to receive the focus. The right hand of God is his authority. It is his right hand, his right arm that brought Israel out of Egypt. And so it is the power of God, the intrinsic power of God, now having visited this thrice holy God in chapter 4, John sees 
on the right hand of him a scroll. So this scroll now has the might of the living God uh, possessing it. And he's holding it. And it has seals. It has seven seals on it. And in verse 2, of course, it says, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice. So we not only have the right arm hand of God for his authority and his power, we have this mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice. It doesn't say which angel, just a mighty angel with a loud voice. And it's a question. Who's worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? God has it. God himself, the almighty God who has, who has life in himself, this thrice holy being who's, who, and, and John is in the throne room of heaven itself and he's holding this, this scroll with seven seals. Who's worthy to open it? He continues, no one in heaven or on earth or under earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. No one. This covers the entire universe. It's not like everyone went hunting and they all came back to report, no, there's no one. This is just God actually using... Uh, prose and certain way of framing things just to tell you no one anywhere is worthy to take the scroll from God's hand and break the seals and read. No one. No one in heaven, no one on earth, no one under the earth. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. This was real for John. John's heart was breaking. And we're going to find out why. Because the scroll is telling them what is going to happen and happen soon. And he's weeping because they're so close. It's like the runner's wall. In a marathon, you're running at a clip of high competitiveness and then there's this wall in which your body just shuts down and, and you literally, it's like running. Have you ever run in your dreams and you can't run? You know, and someone's chasing you and, and right when they grab you, you often wake up because it's your last moment of life. And <gasps> Well, that's what happened to John. He's in the throne room. It's intensifying and he sees the scroll. Uh, someone sitting on the throne and he's got it in his right hand and the mighty angel said, who's worthy? No one. And John weeps. I think of Jesus who wept when he raised Lazarus from the dead. I think of Mary Magdalene and the severe uh, sin of uh, transgression, whatever it was, when she's weeping at Jesus' feet. Because then Peter, when he's weeping after he said, I, I will go to death with you, and yet he denies him three times, and, and he wept. And this is what's going on with John. We're in trouble. Then, and he wept loudly, not just weeping. This is, this is a crying, anguished kind of weeping. And in verse 5, and one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Ah! Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. it's like the answer on steroids has just been given in the midst of his immediate weeping and anguish. And look how it's described. One of the elders again, the name isn't important, there's the command, weep no more, and to behold. Remember that word behold is an announcement to all the listeners to take note. Weep no more. Now there could be a behold before that, but, but there's not. Weep no more. The command comes. But the behold is in the reason why you shouldn't be weeping. 
Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. The lion of the tribe of Judah. You see in very much modern art, you can Google it, the, the Lion of Judah, and sometimes you get the lion and the lamb side by side. They're beautiful, but they're very different metaphors, and yet both of them are there, and they're true. And sometimes we think, oh, the cute little lamb. I've got a little thing on my wall and outside my office of a lamb that has jumped up in the air, and all four feet are off the ground, and he's happy as can be. And I've got a little verse that uh, says that God's lambs are forgiven indeed, and that's where our happiness comes from. As true as that is, that's not the image of the lamb. The image of the lamb is one of sacrifice here, uh, as contrasted with the lion, who is a flesh-ripping, claw killing machine, the king of the beast, out in the field. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. We see that prophesied in Genesis chapter 49, where this promise of deliverance for God's people is going to come from the tribe of Judah. Now, when God's people demanded a king, they got the tribe of Benjamin, Saul, and Saul was rejected. God removed Benjamin, uh, Saul the Benjamite from kingship because of his unfaithfulness and replaced him with David out of Judah. And so here's the tribe of Judah, uh, the, the lion uh, of the tribe of Judah, the claw, fane ripping, flush killing machine in the animal world. And there we have Christ described that way. Paradoxically, his nail-ripping, canine, flesh-ripping canines are fulfilled in the lamb. It's the warrior lamb image that we see here in Revelation. That we see that the same writer, I believe, who wrote the Gospel of John uh, has on the lips of John the Baptist, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. That lion warrior, a canine flesh-ripping warrior, is found in the Lamb. Very polar opposite images, but Scripture merges them. God's victory for our sin problem is through his own self-sacrifice. God's victory to conquer our sin problem is through his own self-sacrifice. The innocent, helpless lamb led to slaughter is the lion of the tribe of Judah with his cane flush ripping canines and ta uh, claw flush ripping power. It's done through self sacrifice. It's done through giving of himself for us. And so God's warfare is one of divine substitution. God has stepped into your stead. God has stepped into your place. He stood the gap. He is standing in your place. Why? To bear that righteous wrath pouring wrath of God upon our sins as he takes your place on the tree and he takes the wrath of God unto himself to rid you of your guilt and the pollution that sin has brought your way. And thus we confess every Sunday. The law of God makes us feel our sin, yet he has also bound the strong man. That divine substitute took care of the penalty of sin and took care of the pollution of sin, and one day you will have neither to 
deal with. Right now, we don't have them to deal with because the victory has already been given, but it's going to be meted out in history, and the culmination is when Christ returns. Okay. The root of David. See, David was promised a kingdom that will have no end. It's an eternal kingdom. I think it's First Chronicles 7. God's promise to him. Your, your kingship is eternal. And in the Psalms, David says himself that this is a, an eternally promised th- enthronement. But David dies. So there must be uh, someone from David's loins. Ah, Solomon! Yes! Nope. Solomon apostatizes with his non-covenantal faithfulness in marriage. And we don't We sit around and debate whether or not Solomon will even be in heaven. So it's not Solomon. Here it is. Isaiah prophesies that out of the stump of Jesse, Jesse is David's father, that divided kingdom was severed. It lost its unity. It was a severed stump and for all practical purposes, look dead. But in that stump, Isaiah says, a root comes forth from the dead stump. That's the root of Jesse here in the text that is uh, on the pen of John in his vision, which reaches back into Isaiah concerning the root of Jesse, the root of David found in in Jesse. And what's the conclusion of this canine claw ripping killer and root that has given new life to the eternal promise? It's that he's conquered. You see, he's 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 come on the cross. One of the gospels says his last thing is it is finished. It is finished. What he came to do is over. It's done. It's a done deal. And sin has been taken care of. So it shocked God's people. It shocked his closest followers. Oh, they saw the lion of Judah. That canine, flesh-ripping, claw-tearing warrior. And that's why David, you see, saw rejected by God, replaced by the tribe of Judah. And Saul was a warrior. Saul was a mighty warrior. And it says Saul killed his thousands, but David slayed his ten thousands. So when God compares David historically even in the shadows and in, and in the future uh, pointing, uh, it is clear even on a fleshly, on a shadowy level, as mighty as Saul was, David is ten times the warrior that Saul was. Saul was the demand of the flesh to have a king to go into battle. That's what Israel wanted. We want a king like other nations to protect us and to keep us safe. They didn't want to trust in God as, his, as their king. So when Saul fizzled, when Saul failed, when Saul reaped the fleshly desires of Israel, God then gave them a king from Judah who killed ten thousands as compared to the thousands of the fleshly king Saul, the tribe of Judah, it's done. He can open the scroll and its seven seals. Verse 7, he goes and he takes the scroll from the right hand of who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. 
Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open the seals, for you were slain. You see, there's that divine substitution. There's the merging of metaphors of the canine flesh-ripping lion and the lamb that's led to the slaughter. You were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. It was so startling I about fell. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. It's a done deal. It's happened. Verse 11, then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures, the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands. You know, some people say, oh, you know, Christianity, it's a little depressing and uh, narrow is the gate. You know, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate that leads to life. Heaven is going to be, uh, you know, you Calvinists that have this divine election, you know, you're lucky if you're going to have Noah's eight plus one. You know, you're all so negative. And the scripture says, you know, but at least the Arminian says, well, at least they don't choose him. You know, your God just doesn't want very many there, I guess. He's like the Marine Corps, the few, the proud, and the chosen. But not so here. This language is, uh, <laughs> I mean, he's, 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 uh, he's grasping at straws here to describe the multitude in heaven. Myriads upon myriads and thousands upon thousands. You know, place in your modern arithmetic and just put it in there. It's going to be numerous beyond the wildest imagination. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, and wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. There's seven blessings. So some have seen the, the, the number seven carrying us through the book of Revelation. And there's seven blessings here uh, for the Lamb who was slain. A power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing are all to the Lamb. And we're going to sing those seven blessings shortly before the Lord's table. And sing it in glory. You have been brought into the throne room vis-a-vis -vis John's vision and Holy Scripture to come into the throne room and see your victory given to you through the promise of the Lamb of God who comes and draws near by his Spirit to you as you walk by here and grab the bread and grab the wine for God's implemented apostolic large T tradition. That's his way of drawing near to the bride who's under persecution. I'm coming near you in promise that you will never be let go, that you will never have a guilt to deal with, that you will eventually be free from every temptation and every swirl that's anti-me, so God says. And we come with future hope. The Lord's table pulls you into that future. That's what it does. That's why this is a, not a, uh, this is a covenant renewal, okay? A covenant renewal. Kind of like a recapitulation, but it's better said to be a covenant renewal. You come here and you see the Lion of Judah and the Lamb uh, that has taken away the sin of the world, the penalty and the power of sin. And he's, he's drunk the vials of God's wrath that we see here in Revelation that the lectionary conveniently withholds because they don't want to make you feel badly. Verse 13, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. Now, interestingly, they went to find somebody worthy to open up the seals. There was no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. And now here, as a result of the Lamb being revealed as God's warrior, it now says that every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and adds in the sea, and all of them are saying and sinning. You see how no one's worthy to be 
found anywhere. And then comes the lion and the lamb of Judah. And then comes everywhere those who see him then say, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing, honor, glory, might forever and ever. And the four creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. And John saw all of that. All you see is me. Just little old me telling you what the text says. We will see this, not in a vision. We are going to see the physical return of Jesus Christ. Either we're going to come with him, or he's going to come while we're still here and we'll be caught up with him in the air and in the twinkling of an eye, new bodies that you already have because of his work on the tree and you're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. No more thoughts of, I don't want to do the dishes. As frivolous as that sounds, no more pain and fragmentation and, and, and isolation even though you're surrounded by people it's all gone in a twinkling of an eye no purgatory in my understanding of scripture none needed amen Let's stand and confess together the Nicene Creed. I'll be replacing it with the Apostles' Creed when Pentecost arrives. So we have a few more Sundays to confess this ancient confession of the church found in the beginning of your songbook. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty. together in unison and then Bella will lead us into the doxology.
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. The feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain. On the night that the Passover took place, he was with his disciples. And after supper, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. 
In the same way, he took the cup of blessing, and when he had given thanks, he poured the fruit of the vine, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you, for the remission of sins. This drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Your victory is here in the blood-soaked Lamb of God who gave his flesh, his life for you. So come in covenant renewal and let God draw near and say, for you is here in my Son. So come in faith and be blessed. Now let's stand and sing together our closing hymn. Number one. 243. 243. Thank you.
Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy living, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifest through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Go in the peace that your death is but a passage into the very presence of the one who loves you more than you even love yourself. Be blessed in Christ. Thank you for coming.